Chapter 7 Expect the best and get it. Why does my boy fail in every job he gets? Asked a puzzled father about his 30-year-old son. It was indeed difficult to answer the failure of this young man, for seemingly he had everything. Of good family, his educational and business opportunities were beyond the average. Nevertheless, he had a tragic flair for failure. Everything he touched went wrong. He tried hard enough, yet somehow he missed success. Presently, he found an answer. A curiously simple but potent answer. After practicing this newfound secret for a while, he lost the flair for, for failure and acquired the touch of success. His personality began to focus, his powers to fuse. Not long ago at luncheon, I could not help admiring this dynamic man at the height of his power. You amaze me, I commented. A few years ago, you were failing at everything. Now you have worked up an original idea into a fine business. You are a leader in your community. Please explain this remarkable change in you. Really, it was quite simple, he replied. I merely learned the magic of believing. I discovered that if you expect the worst, you will get the worst. And if you expect the best, you will get the best. It all happened through actually practicing a verse from the Bible. And what is that verse? If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Mark 9.23 I was brought up in a religious home, he explained, and heard that verse many times, but it never had any effect upon me. One day in your church, I heard you emphasize those words in a talk. In a flash of insight, I realized that the key I had missed was that my mind was not trained to believe, to think positively, to have faith in either God or myself. I followed your suggestion of putting myself in God's hands and practiced your outlying techniques of faith. I trained myself to think positively about everything. Along with that, I tried to live right. He smiled and said, God and I struck up a partnership. When I adopted that policy, things began to change almost at once for me. I got into the habit of expecting the best, not the worst. And that is the way my affairs have turned out lately. I guess it's a kind of miracle, isn't it? He asked as he concluded his fascinating story. But it wasn't miraculous at all. Actually, what had happened was that he had learned to use one of the most powerful laws in the world, a law recognized alike by psychology and religion, namely, change your mental habits to belief instead of disbelief, learn to expect, not to doubt. In, in so doing, you bring everything into the realm of possibility. This does not mean that by believing you are necessarily going to get everything you want or think you want. Perhaps that would not be good for you. When you put your trust in God, he guides your mind so that you do not want things that are not good for you or that are in har in inharmonious with God's will. But it does definitely mean that when you learn to believe that when then that which has seemingly been impossible moves into the area of the possible. Every great thing at last becomes, for you, a possibility. William James, the famous psychologist, said, Our belief at the beginning of a doubtful undertaking is the one thing. Now get that, is the one thing that ensures the successful outcome of your venture. To learn to believe is of primary importance. It is the basic factor of succeeding in any undertaking. When you expect the best, you release a magnetic force in your mind which by law of attraction tends to bring the best to you. But if you expect the worst, you release from your mind the power of repulsion which tends to force the best from you. It is amazing how a sustained expe expectation of the best sets in motion 
forces which cause the best to materialize. An interesting illustration of this fact was described some years ago by Hugh Fullerton, a famous sports writer of a bygone era. As a boy, Hugh Fullerton was my favorite writer of sports stories. One story which I had never forgotten concerned Josh O'Reilly, one-time manager of the San Antonio Cub of the Texas League. O'Reilly had a roster of great players, seven of whom had been hitting over 300, and everybody thought his team would easily take the championship. But the club fell into a slump and lost 17 of the first 20 games. The players simply couldn't hit anything, and each began to accuse the other of being a jinx to the team. Playing the Dallas club, a rather poor team that year, only one San Antonio player got a hit, and that, strangely enough, was the pitcher. O'Reilly's team was badly beaten that day. In the clubhouse after the game, the players were a disc 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 disconsolate lot. Josh O'Reilly knew that he had an aggregation of stars and he realized that their trouble was simply that they were thinking wrong. They didn't expect to get a hit. They didn't expect to win. They expected to be defeated. They were thinking not victory but defeat. Their mental pattern was not one of expectation but of doubt. This negative mental process inhibited them, froze their muscles, threw them off their timing, and there was no free flow of easy, of easy power through the team. It so happened that a preacher named Sla Slater was popular in that neighborhood at the time. He claimed to be a faith healer and apparently was getting some astounding results. Throngs crowded to hear him, and most everybody had confidence in him. Perhaps the fact that they did believe in his power enabled Schlater to receive to, to achieve results. O'Reilly asked each player to, to lend him his two best bats. Then he asked the members of the team to stay in the clubhouse until he returned. He put the bats in a wheelbarrow and went off with them. He was gone for an hour. He returned jubilantly to tell the players that Schlater, the preacher, had blessed the bats and that these bats now contained a power that could not be overcome. The players were astounded and delighted. The next day they overwhelmed Dallas, getting 37 base hits and 20 runs. They hammered their way through the lead to a championship. And Hugh Fel Fellerton said that for years in the Southwest, a, ball, a player could pay a large sum for a Slater bat. Regardless of Slater's personal power, the fact remains that something tremendous happened in the minds of those ball players. Their thought pattern was changed. They began thinking in terms of expectation, not doubt. They expected not the worst, but the best. They expected hits, runs, victories, and they got them. They had the power to get what they wanted. There was no difference in the bats themselves. I'm quite sure of that. But there was certainly a difference in the minds of the men who used them. Now they knew they could make hits. Now they knew they could get runs. Now they knew they could win. A new thought pattern changed the minds of those men so that the creative power of faith could operate. Perhaps you have not been doing so well in the game of life. Perhaps you stand up to a bat. Perhaps you stand up to bat and cannot make a hit. You strike out time and again and your batting average is lamentably low. Let me give you a suggestion. I guarantee that it will work. The basis for my assurance is the fact that thousands of people have been trying it with very great results. Things will be very different for you 
if you give this method a real trial. Start reading the New Testament and notice the number of times it refers to faith. Select a dozen of the strongest statements about, about faith, the ones that you like the best. Then memorize each one. Let these faith concepts drop into your conscious mind. Say them over and over again, especially just before going to sleep at night. By a process of spiritual osmosis, they will sink from your conscious into your subconscious mind and in time will modify and resonate your basic thought pattern. This process will, cha will change your this process will change you into a believer, into an expector, and when you become such, you will in due course become an achiever. You will have new power to get what God and you decide you really want from life. The most powerful force in human nature is the spiritual power technique taught in the Bible. Very absolutely, the Bible emphasizes the method by which a person can make something of himself. Faith, belief, positive thinking, faith in God, faith in other people, faith in yourself, faith in life. This is the essence of the technique that teaches. If thou canst believe, it says, all things are possible to him that believeth. Mark 9.23 If ye have faith, nothing shall be impossible unto you. Matthew 17.20 According to your faith, be it unto you. Matthew 9, 29 Believe, believe, so it drives home the truth that faith moves mountains. Some skeptical person who has never learned this powerful law of the effect of right thinking may doubt my assertions regarding the amazing results which happen when this technique is employed. Things become better when you expect the best instead of the worst. For the reason that being freed from self-doubt, you can put your whole self into your endeavor and nothing can stand in the way of the man who focuses his entire self on a problem. When you approach a difficulty as a personal unity, the difficulty, which itself is a demonstration of disunity, tends to deteriorate. When the entire concentration of all your force physical, emotional, and spiritual is brought to bear, the consolidation of these powers properly employed is quite irresistible. Expecting the best means that you put your whole heart, i.e. the central essence of your personality, into what you want to accomplish. People are defeated in life not because of lack of ability, but for lack of wholeheartedness. They do not wholeheartedly expect to succeed. Their heart isn't in it, which is to say they themselves are not fully res fully given. Results do not yield themselves to the person who refuses to give himself to the desired results. A major key to success in this life, to attaining that which you deeply desire, is to be completely released and throw all there is of yourself into your job or any project in which you are engaged. In other words, whatever you are doing, give it all you've got. Give every bit of yourself. Hold nothing back. Life cannot deny itself to the person who gives life his all. But most people, unfortunately, don't do that. In fact, very few people do. And this is a tragic cause of failure. Or, if not failure, it is the reason we only half attain a famous Canadian athletic athletic coach, Ace Percival, Percival, says that most people, athletes as well as non-athletes, are holdouts. That is to say, they are always keeping something in reserve. They do not invest them, themselves 100% in competition. Because of that fact, they never achieve the highest of which they are capable. Red Barber famous baseball announcer, told me that he had known few athletes who completely give themselves. Don't be a holdout. 
go all out. Do this and life will not hold out on you. A famous trapeze artist was instructing his students how to perform on the high trapeze bar. Finally, having given full explanations and instruction in this skill, he told them to demonstrate their ability. One student, looking up at the insecure perch upon which he must perform, was suddenly filled with fear. He froze completely. He had a terrifying vision of himself falling to the ground. To the ground. He couldn't move a muscle. So deep was his fright. I, I can't do it. I, I can't do it. He, gra- he gasped. The instructor put his arm around the boy's shoulders and said, Son, you can do it, and I will tell you how. Then he made a statement which of an inestimable importance. It is one of the wisest remarks I have ever heard. He said, throw your heart over the bar and your body will follow. Copy that one sentence. Write it on a card and put it in your pocket. Place it under the glass on your desktop. Tack it up on your wall. Stick it in your shaving mirror. Better still, write it on your mind. You will really want to do something with life. It's packed with power. That sentence, throw your heart over the bar and your body will follow. Heart is the symbol of creative activity. Fire the heart with where you want to go and what you want to be. Get it so deeply fixed in your unconscious that you will not take no for an answer. Then your entire personality will follow where your heart is, where your, where your heart leads. Throw your heart over the bar means to throw your faith over your difficulty. Throw your affirmation over every barrier. Throw your visualization over your obstacles. In other words, throw the spiritual essence of you over the bar and your material self will follow in the victory groove thus pioneered by your faith-inspired mind. Expect the best, not the worst, and you will attain your heart's desire. It is what it is in in the heart of you, either good or bad, strong or weak, that finally comes to you. Emerson said, Beware of what you want, for you will get it. That this philosophy is of practical value is illustrated by the experience of a young woman whom I interviewed a number of years ago. She made an appointment to see me in my office at two o'clock on a certain afternoon. Being quite busy that day, I had gotten a little behind schedule and it was about five minutes after two when I walked into the conference room where she was waiting. It was obvious that she was displeased for her lips were pressed firmly together. It's five minutes after two, and we had an appointment at 2 p.m., she said. I always admire promptness. So do I. I always believe in being prompt, and I hope you will forgive me for my unavoidable delay, I said with a smile. But she was not in a smiling mood, for she said crisply, I have a very important problem to present to you, and I want an answer, and I expect an answer. Then she shout, then she shot out at me. I might as well put it to you bluntly. I want to get married. Well, I replied, that is a perfectly normal desire, and I should like to help you. I, I want to know why I can't get married, she continued. Every time I form a relationship with a man... The next thing I know, he fades out of the picture, and chance and another chance is gone by. And she added, speaking frankly, I am not I am not getting any younger. You conduct a personal problem clinic to help people, and you have had some experience, and I am putting my problem right up to you. Tell me, why can't I get married? I study her to see if she was the kind of person to whom One could speak frankly, for certain things had to be said if she really meant business. Finally, I decided that she was of big enough enough caliber to take the medicine that will be required if she was to correct her personality difficulties. So I said, 
Well, now let's analyze the situation. Obviously, you have a good mind and a fine personality. And if I may say so, you are a very handsome lady. All these things were true. I congratulated her in every way that I honestly could. But then I said, I think that I see your difficulty, and it is this. You took me to task because I was five minutes late for our appointment. You were really quite severe with me. Has it ever occurred to you that your attitude represents a pretty serious fault? I think a husband would have a very difficult time if you checked him that closely all the time. In fact, you would so dominate him that, even if you did marry, your marital life would be unsatisfactory. Love cannot live under, domin under do domination. Then I said, you have a very firm way of pressing your lips together which indicates a domineering attitude. The average male, I might as well tell you, does not like to be dominated, at least so that he knows it. Then I added, I think you would be ver a ver I think you would be a very attractive person if you got those two firm lines out of your face. You might have a little softness, a little tenderness, and those lines are too firm to be soft. Then I observed her dress, which was obviously quite expensive, but she didn't wear it very well, and so I said, this may be a bit out of my line, and I hope you won't mind, but perhaps you could get that dress to hang a little better. I know, but, oh no, I know my description was awkward. But she was a good sport about it and laughed right out loud. She said, you certainly don't use style phraseology, but I get the idea. Then I suggested, perhaps it might help to get your hair fixed up a little. It's a little floaty. Then you might also add a little sweet smelling perfume, just a whiff of it. But the really important thing is to get a new attitude that will change the lines on your face and give you that indefinable quality known as spiritual joy. This, I am certain, will release charm and loveliness in you. Well, she burst out, never did I expect to get this combination of advice in a minister's office. No, I chuckled, I suppose not, but nowadays... We have to cover the whole field in a human problem. Then I told her about an old professor of mine at Old Wesleyan University, Royally Walker, who said, God runs a beauty parlor. He explained that some, that some girls, when they came to college, were very pretty. But when they came back to visit the campus 30 years later, their beauty had faded. The moonlight and roses loveliness of their youth did not last on the other hand other girls came to college who were very plain but when they returned thirty years they were beautiful women what made the difference he asked the latter had the beauty of an inner spiritual life written on their faces and then he added god runs a beauty parlor well this young well this young lady thought about what i told her for a few minutes and then she said, there's a lot of truth in what you say. I'll try it. Here is where her strong personality proved effective, for she did try it. For she did try it. A number of years went by, a number of years went by, and I had forgotten her. Then in a certain city, after making a speech, a very lovely looking lady with a fine looking man and a little boy about ten years of age came up to me. The lady asked smilingly, Well, how do you think it hangs? How do I think what hangs? I asked, puzzled. My dress, she said. Do you think it hangs right? Bewildered, I said. Yes, I think it hangs all right. But just why do you ask? Don't you know me? She asked. I see a great many people in my life, I said. Frankly, no. I don't think I have ever seen you before. Then she reminded me of our talk of years ago, which I have described. Meet my husband and my little boy. 
what you told me was absolutely true she said very earnestly i was the most frustrated unhappy individual imaginable when i came to see you but i put into practice the principles you suggested i really did and they worked her husband then spoke up and said there and said there was never a sweeter person in the world than mary here and i must say that she looked the part she had evidently visited god's beauty parlor not only did she experience a softening and mellowing of her inner spirit but she properly used a great quality which she possessed namely the driving force to get what she wanted this led her to the point where she was willing to change herself so that her dreams could be realized she had that quality of mind whereby she took herself in hand she applied the spiritual techniques and she had a profound and yet simple faith that what her heart told her she wanted could be obtained by the proper creative and positive procedures so the formula is to know what you want test it to see if it is a right thing change yourself in such a manner that it will naturally come to you and always have faith with the creative force of belief you stimulate that particular gathering together of circumstances which brings your brings your cherished wish to pass students of modern dynamic thought are realizing more and more the practical value of the ideas and teachings of jesus especially such truths as the dictum according to your faith be it unto you matthew nine twenty nine according to your faith in yourself according to your faith in your job according to your faith in god this far will get you this far will you get and no further if you believe in your job and in yourself and in your opportunities of your country and if you believe in god and will work hard and study and put yourself into it in other words if you throw your heart over the bar you can swing up to any high place to which you want to take your life and your service and your achievement whenever you have a bar that is to say a barrier in front of you stop close your eyes visualize everything that is above the bar and nothing that is below it then imaginatively throw your heart over that bar and see yourself as being given lifting power to raise above it believe that you are experiencing this up thrust of force you will be amazed at the lifting force you will receive if in the depth of your mind you visualize the best and employ the powers of faith and energy you will get the best naturally in this process of achieving the best it is important to know where you want to go in life you can reach your goal your best dreams can come true you can get where you want to go only if you know what your goal is your expectation must have a clearly defined ob ob objective lots of people get nowhere simply because they do not know where they want to go they have no clear-cut precisely defined purpose you cannot expect the best if you think aimlessly aimlessly a young man of 26 consulted me because he was dissatisfied with his job he was ambitious to fill a bigger niche in life and wanted to know how to improve his circumstances his motive seemed un unselfish and entirely worthwhile well where do you want to go i asked i just don't know exactly he said hesitantly i have never seen any thought i've never given i've never given any thought I only know I want to go somewhere other than where I am. What can you do best? I then asked. What are your strong points? I don't know, he responded. I never thought that over either. But what would you like to do if you had your choice? What do you really want to do? I insisted. I just can't say, he replied duly. I don't really know what i would like to do i never thought it over guess i ought to figure that one out too now look here i said you want to go somewhere from where you are but you don't know where you want to go you don't know what 
you can do or what you would like to do. You will have to get your ideas organized before you can expect to start getting anywhere. That is the failure point with many people. They never get anywhere because they have only an, a hazy idea where they want to go, what they want to do. No, ob no objective leads to no end. We made a thorough we made a thorough analysis testing this young man's capabilities and found some assets of personality he did not know he possessed but it was necessary to supply a dynamic to move him forward so we taught him the techniques of practical faith today he is on the way to achievement now he knows where he wants to go and how to get there he knows what the best is and he expects to attain it and he will nothing can stop him I asked an outstanding newspaper editor an inspiring personality how did you get to be the editor of this important paper I wanted to be he replied simply is that all there is to it I asked you wanted to be and so there you are well that may not be all of it but that was a large part of the process he explained I believe that if you want to get somewhere you must decide definitely where you want to be or what you want to accomplish be sure it is a right objective then photograph this objective on your mind and hold it there work hard believe in it and the thought will become so powerful that it will tend to assure success there is a deep tendency he declared to become what your mind pictures providing you hold the mental picture strongly enough and if the objective is sound so saying the editor pulled a well-worn card from his wallet and said i repeat this quotation every day of my life it has become my dominating thought i copied it and i am giving it to you a man who is self-reliant positive optimistic and undertakes his work with the assurance of success magnetizes his condition he draws to himself the creative powers of the universe it is indeed a fact that the person who thinks with a positive self-reliance and optimism does magnetize his condition and release his power to attain his goal so expect the best at all times never think of the worst drop it out of your thought relegate it let there be no thought in your mind that the worst will happen. Avoid entertaining the concept of the worst, for whatever you take into your mind can grow there. Therefore, take the best into your mind and only that. Nurture it. Concentrate on it. Emphasize it. Visualize it. Prayerize it. Surround it with faith. Make it your obsession. Expect the best in spiritually creative mind power aided by god power will produce the best it may be that as you read this book you are down to what you think is the worst and you may remark that no amount of thinking will affect your situation the answer to that objective is that it simply isn't so even if you may be down to the worst the best is potentially within you you have only to find it release it and rise up with it this requires courage and character to be sure but the main requirement is faith cultivate faith and you will have the necessary courage and character a woman was compelled by adversary to go into sales work a type of activity for which she had no training she undertook to demonstrate vacuum cleaners from house to house she took a negative attitude toward herself and her job she just didn't believe she could do this job she knew she was going to fail she feared to approach a house even though she came for, for a requested demonstration she believed that she could not make the sale as a result as is not surprising she failed in a high percentage of her interviews one day she changed she, one day she chanced to call up a woman who evidenced consideration beyond the average to this customer the saleswoman poured out her tale of defeat and powerlessness the other woman listened patiently then said quietly 
If you expect failure, you will get failure. But if you expect to succeed, I am sure you will succeed. And she added, I will give you a formula. I will give you a formula which I believe will help you. It will restyle your thinking, give you new confidence, and help you to accomplish your goals. Repeat this formula before every call. Believe in it and then marvel at what it will do for you. This is it. If God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8.31 But change it by personalizing it so that you can so that you say if God be for me who can be against me if God be for me then I know that with God's help I can sell vacuum cleaners God realizes that you want security and support for your little children and yourself and by practicing the method I I suggest you will be given power to get what you want she learned to utilize this formula she approached each house expecting to make a sale, affirming and picturizing positive, not negative results. As the saleswoman employed this principle, she presently acquired new courage, new faith, and new deeper confidence in her own ability. Now she declares, God, help me sell vacuum cleaners, and who can dispute it? It is a well-defined and authentic principle that what the mind profoundly expects, it tends to receive. Perhaps this is true because what you really expect is what you actually want. Unless you really want something sufficiently to create an atmosphere of positive factors by your dynamic desire, it is likely to elude you. If you, if, if with all your heart, that is the secret. If with all your heart, that is to say, if with the full complement of your personality, you reach out creatively toward your heart's desire, your reach will not be in vain. Let me give you four let me give you four words as a formulation of a great law. Faith, power, works, wonders. Those four words are packed with dynamic and creative force. Hold them in your conscious mind. Let sink into the subconscious. Let sink into the unconscious. And they can help you to overcome any difficulty. Hold them in your thoughts. Say them over and over again. Say them until your mind accepts them. Until you believe them. Faith, power, works, wonder. I have no doubt about the effectiveness of this concept. For I have seen it work so often that my enthusiasm for faith power is absolutely boundless. You can overcome any obstacle. You can achieve the most tremendous things by faith power. And how do you develop faith power? The answer is to saturate your mind with the great words of the Bible. If you will spend one hour a day reading the Bible and committing its great passages to memory, thus allowing them to recondition your personality, the change in you and in your experience will be a little short of, a, of miraculous. Just one section of the Bible will accomplish this for you. The 11th chapter of Mark is enough. You will find a secret in the following words, and this is one of the greatest formulas the book contains. Have faith in God. That's positive, isn't it? For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, that specific, Be thou removed, that is, stand aside, and be thou cast into the sea, that means, out of sight. Anything you threw into the sea is gone for good. Like Titanic lies at the bottom of the sea, and the sea bottom is lined with ships. Cast your opposition called a mountain into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart. Why does this statement use the word heart? Because it means you are not to doubt in your subconscious, in the inner essence of you. It isn't so superficial as a doubt in the conscious mind. That is a normal, intelligent questioning. 
it's a deep fundamental doubt that is to be avoided but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass he shall have whatever whatsoever he saith mark eleven twenty three to twenty twenty two to twenty three this is not some theory that i have thought up it is taught by the most reliable book known to man generation after generation no matter what develops in the way of knowledge and science the bible is read by more people than any other book humanity rightly has more confidence in it in it than any other document ever written and the bible tells us that faith power works wonders the reason however that great things do not happen to some people is that they are not specific in their application of faith power we are told ye shall say to this mountain that is to say do not address your efforts to the entire mountain range of all your difficulties but attack one thing that may be defeating you at the moment be specific take them one by one if there is something you want how do you go about getting it in the first place ask yourself should i want it should i want it test that question very honestly in prayer to be sure you want it and whether you should have it if if you can answer that question in the affirmative then ask god for it and don't be a backward and don't be a backward in asking him and if god having more insight believes that you shouldn't have it you needn't worry he won't give it to you but if it, but if it is a right thing ask him for it and when you ask do not doubt in your heart be specific the validity of this law was impressed upon me by something that a friend of mine in midwestern a midwestern businessman told me this man is a big ex extrovertishly extrovertish outgoing lovable gentleman and a truly great christian he teaches the largest bible class in his state in a town where he lives he is mr town himself he is head of a plant employing forty thousand people his office desk is full of religious literature even has some of the even has some of my sermons and pamphlets there in his plant one of the biggest in the united states he manufactures reg refrigerators he is one of those whole-souled rugged individuals who has the capacity to have faith he believes that god is right there in his office with him my friend said preach a big faith not any little old watered down faith don't be afraid that faith isn't scientific enough i am a scientist he said i use science in my business every day and i use the bible every day the bible will work everything in the bible works if you believe in it when he was made general manager of this plant it was whispered around town now that mr blank is general manager we'll have to bring our bibles to work with us after a few days he called into his office some of the men who were making this remark he uses language they understand and he said i hear you guys are going around town saying that now i'm general manager you will have to bring your bibles to work with you oh we didn't mean that they said it and they said an embarrassment he said well you know that's a blank good idea but i don't want you to come lugging them under your arms bring them here in your hearts and in your minds if you come with the spirit of good will and faith in your hearts and minds believe me we'll do business so he asked the kind of faith to have is a specific kind the kind that moves this particular mountain suddenly he said to me did you ever have a, a toe bother you i was rather astonished by that but before i could answer he said i had a toe that bothered me and i took it to the doctors here in town and they are wonderful doctors and they said there wasn't anything wrong with the toe that they could see 
but they were wrong because it hurt. So I went out and got a book on anatomy and read up on toes. It is really a simple construction. There's nothing but a few muscles and ligaments and a bony structure. It seemed that anybody who knows anything about a toe could fix it. But I couldn't get anybody to fix that toe, and it hurt me all the time. So I sat down one day and, look, and took a look at that toe. Then I said, Lord, I'm sending this toe right back to the plant. You made that toe. I make refrigerators, and I know all there is to know about a refrigerator. When we sell a refrigerator, we guarantee the customer service. If this refrigerator doesn't work right, and if our service agents can't fix it, he brings it back to the plant and we fix it, because we know how. So I said, Lord, you made this toe. You manufactured it, and your service and your service agents. The doctors don't seem to know how to get it to working right. And if you don't mind, Lord, I would like to have it fixed up as soon as possible, because it's bothering me. How is the toe now? I asked. Perfect, he replied. Perhaps this is a foolish kind of story, and I laughed when he told it, but I almost cried too, for I saw a wonderful look on that man's face as he related that incident of a specific prayer. Be specific. Ask God for any right thing, but as a little child, don't doubt. Doubt closes the power flow faith opens it the power of faith is so tremendous that there is nothing that almighty god cannot do for us with us or through us if we let him channel his power through our minds so roll these words around on your tongue say them over and over again until they lodge deeply in your heart and until they get down into your heart deeply lodge deeply in your mind until they get down into your heart until they take possession of the essence of you whosoever shall say unto this mountain be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass he shall have whatsoever he saith mark eleven twenty three I suggested these principles some months ago to an old friend of mine, a man who perpetually expects the worst. Up to the time of our discussion, never did I hear him say anything other than the things that would not turn out right. He took this negative attitude towards every objective, toward every project or, pro or project or problem. He expressed vigorous disbelief in the principles outlined in this chapter and offered to make a test to prove that I am wrong in my conclusions. He is an honest man, and he faithfully tried these principles in connection with some, several matters and actually kept a scorecard. He did this for six months. He volunteered the information at the end of that period that 85% of the matters under investigation had turned out satisfactorily. I am now convinced, he said, although... I wouldn't have believed it possible, but it is evidently a fact that if you expect the best, you are given some strange kind of power to create conditions that produce the desired results. From now on, I am changing my mental attitude and shall expect the best, not the worst. My test indicates that this is not theory, but a scientific way to meet life's situations. I might add that even the high percentage he attained can be raised with practice. And of course, practice in the art of expectation is an essential, is as essential as practice on a mu musical instrument or with a golf club. Nobody ever mastered any skill except through intensive, persistent, and intelligent practice. Also, it should be noted that my friend approached this experiment at first in a spirit of doubt which would tend adversely to affect his earlier results. Every day, as you confront the problems of life, I suggest that you affirm as follows. I believe God gives me power to attain what I really want. Never mention the worst. Never think of it. Drop it out of your consciousness 
at least 10 times a day affirm, I expect the best, and with God's help, will attain the best. In so doing, your thoughts will turn toward the best and become conditioned to its realization. This practice will bring all of your powers to focus upon the attainment of the best. It will bring the best to you.